Welcome to today's webinar, The Fundamentals of Risk Management and Insurance, Viewed Through the Lens of Emerging Technology, Part 2, brought to you by NCSL. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Ethan Wilson. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to our NCSL webinar, The Fundamentals of Risk Management and Insurance, Viewed Through the Lens of Emerging Technology, Part 2, Regulation and Legislation presented in collaboration with the Institute's Griffith Insurance Education Foundation. My name is Ethan Wilson, and along with Heather Morton, we staff NCSL's Insurance Task Force. We are joined by Frank Paul Tomasello, Senior Director of the Insurance Griffith Foundation, who will serve as the moderator of today's program, and Dr. James Carson of the University of Georgia. In just a moment, I will turn things over to our presenters, but first, for those unfamiliar with the NCSL Insurance Task Force, let me note that our mission is to engage members in policy discussions, educate members, and extend networking opportunities to legislative leaders on insurance issues through a series of well-defined programs, webinars, and policy forums. In keeping with that mission, we are pleased to collaborate with Mr. Tomasello and his wonderful team at the Institute's Griffith Foundation to present today's nonpartisan and non-advocative discussion focusing on regulation and legislation. Thank you, Ethan. It's our pleasure to join forces with NCSL and present the program this afternoon. Our organization's shared commitment to educating public policymakers is at the core of this collaborative relationship. For those unfamiliar with our organization, the Institute's Griffith Foundation is a leading resource for objective insurance information for public policymakers in the United States. Insurance and risk management play an important role in the financial fabric of our country, protecting many aspects of our personal lives, professional endeavors, and national economy. Our mission is to empower policymakers through a greater understanding of risk management. We conduct a variety of nonpartisan, non-advocative seminars on risk management presented by leading scholars from top universities, and among them is Dr. James Carson, the Daniel P. Amos Distinguished Professor of Insurance in the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. Professor Carson is a former president of the American Risk and Insurance Association and the Western Risk and Insurance Association. He's a member of the Risk Theory Society and the Southern Risk and Insurance Association. In addition, he serves on the executive committee of the Institute's Griffith Foundation. And to learn more about his accomplishments and research interests, we direct you to the website of the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. That address, www.terry.uga.edu. Throughout our presentation, should you have questions for Professor Carson, you may type them into the online interface on your computer screen. There is a question box on your screen designed specifically for that purpose. And we'll allot time at the end of the program for a bit of Q&A as well. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor James Carson to our microphones. Uh, Professor Carson, first off, we thank you for joining us. Uh, legislation and regulation uh, play a, a very important role in insurance. Uh, where do we start in examining such a broad topic? Uh, well, Frank, uh, you're absolutely right to mention that insurance regulation and legislation is a, a really broad area. And it's one, of course, that's filled local and national headlines, both recently and, and of course, over many years, uh, related to specific areas like uh, prices, for auto and health insurance, flood, earthquake, uh, insurer claims practices, and so on. Um, you know, before jumping in to start our discussion on these topics, let me also welcome everyone to the session and also emphasize that we encourage uh, any questions throughout the next hour, and we'll certainly do our best to address what's on everybody's mind as we uh, go forward today. So uh, let me start by giving the big picture of where we'll focus our discussion today. We'll essentially cover seven broad areas, 
And these seven areas will show up on the slides um, in red as we go forward. And so um, these seven broad areas that we'll look at today include uh, the big picture of insurance regulation and the role of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Uh, we'll touch on some of the different activities of insurance regulators, um, take a brief look at some of the different insurance programs that are run by states. Uh, market conduct and solvency is one of the most important areas of state insurance regulation, so we'll certainly look at that. Um, as part of overall insurer regulation, we'll touch on rate and form um, regulation, and then insurance licensing. And then um, as we get toward the end, if we have time, we'll also touch on some of the different issues surrounding insurance fraud. Okay, so our first uh, big area that we'll look at today then is, is um, big picture of insurance regulation and the role of uh, NAIC. So one of the big things that state regulators do is, is uh, on the front end make sure that any new insurer um, has adequate financing. Um, once that insurer is kind of up and running, the state insurance department, um, Office of Insurance Regulation is going to make sure that that company's investments uh, make sense, have the appropriate risk profile and so forth. And certainly uh, state regulators also are involved in um, what's, what's really behind the scenes, but in terms of insurance premium taxes as well. And, and just to kind of kick it off, when, an, when a new insurer is formed, the most common type of legal ownership is going to either be a mutual insurer or a stock insurer. So there certainly are some other forms out there, but the, certainly the two most common, and we'll come back and touch on these, would be either a mutual or a stock. And then, and then once these companies are up and running, um, as we mentioned, um, states will also be interested in the prices or the rates that these companies charge. Um, some lines of insurance will be more scrutinized in terms of prices than other lines. Um, in addition, there will be a difference between uh, scrutiny of prices in personal lines coverages, so your auto, homeowners, and so on, versus uh, insurance coverages for policies that companies like IBM or General Motors would face. And so as you'd expect, there's you know, far less scrutiny of prices when you're talking about big, sophisticated commercial buyers. Um, Insurance departments, offices of regulation will also certainly look at um, licensing of different um, persons in insurance. So from the producer side, the sales side, uh, marketing side, but also um, when it comes to claims. And, and there may be some education requirements and licensing there as well. In terms of the main goals of insurance regulation, there's, there's really two that I would point out. And the big picture is, is to protect consumers. And that can take many forms. Um, and we'll touch on those as we, as we go forward here. Um, and so, but to separate out consumer protection um, kind of in a detailed way. But then as part of that, um, you know, if we buy an insurance policy, pay our premiums, and then have a loss, that, that insurance contract really isn't going to do much for us if the insurer isn't around and financially able to pay the claim. And so um, insurer solvency, or another way to, to frame that would be insurer financial strength to make sure that that company is, is around and able to pay the claims when they happen. Um, okay, so we mentioned this National Association of Insurance Commissioners early, earlier, and it's really, you know, kind of the, the, the group that comes together among the states to uh, share information and 
and as as a as a group as a body, the NAIC really focuses on encouraging cooperation among and across the states. And so the idea is that um, is that we've got literally you know 50 different sets of insurance regulations. Um, sure, there's some overlap as we look across the states, um, but states are largely free to experiment, um, try new things, and it often happens that a particular state will think of an idea, try out something new, and that works really well, perhaps. And so you'd certainly want to encourage other states to think about and possibly adopt these things that work really well. On the flip side, a state uh, might try something new, and it you know could confl completely flop. And and by the same token, other states can learn from those um, you know bad experiences as well. So encourage uh, sharing of information, cooperation across the states. Um, the NEIC certainly will be largely involved in coming up with new uh, what are called model laws. And so these are not laws that are implemented or anything by the NEIC, but they're laws that have um, some language related to regulations that states can then adopt, um, either kind of as is or, or typically, you know, each state will modify and um, kind of make, make that model law more uh, relevant and usable for, for their particular state. And so important to mention, to mention uh, the NEIC does a lot, but it, it has no real direct regulatory authority. Um, okay, so we've kind of been calling the different state uh, departments of insurance, and that's certainly a, a common title um, across the states, but, but the department also might be called, um, instead of insurance, it might be broader, and it might include um, also banking or just financial services in general. And, and of course, the role of these various departments of insurance or financial services is to enforce the various insurance laws and rules and regulations that have been passed by legislators. Um, you might be curious to, to know, and, and you may already know this, um, but Massachusetts was actually the first uh, state to enact a law that required insurers to maintain adequate reserves, and that dates back all the way to 1837, so not quite 200 years ago, but, but getting back there. And we'll come back, um, you know, many of you, if not, maybe all of you have kind of looked at reserves and you know what that is, but we'll certainly touch on, on exactly what we mean when we talk about insurer reserves also. Um, some of the different activities that an insurance department will do um, approve policy forms, and so the, the, the literal contracts that an insurer wants to use typically need to have approval. And so from your auto, your homeowners, your personal umbrella policy, those have all been scrutinized, looked at, and approved by the time a consumer would ever get those. As well, when it comes to the prices that an insurer wants to, to charge, um, you, you might think that most of the regulation would be on the, on, the, on the upper end. In other words, we don't want to have insurers charge any more than a certain price, and, and certainly that's true, um, but it's also somewhat surprising for some people to hear that, that uh, regulators also take a look at the, at the low side to make sure that prices are going to be at least sufficient to pay claims. And so there's, there, there can often be a, an incentive for an insurer to sometimes charge too little. And from a consumer point of view, that might sound like uh, a non-issue, um, you know, no price is too low. But, but of course, um, when the losses happen, so when the storms come, uh, regulators want to make sure, and of course consumers ultimately would as well, want to make sure there's enough funds 
for those claims to be paid. So uh, third point there, license new insurers. So it's relatively straightforward and, and relatively easy to start an insurance company. Um, there's some hoops to jump through and some rules to follow, um, but, it's, but it doesn't take a whole lot of capital when, it, when you think about starting a new company and, and any new company that wants to sell insurance needs to be licensed. And so um, states will certainly play a big role in that, um, as well as some of the individuals that we mentioned. So on the sales side, on the claims side, and, and some other roles also need to hold a license. Uh, it'd be great if losses never happened, but of course we wouldn't need insurance if, if the storms uh, never came. And so um, one of the other areas that insurance departments often uh, spend a fair bit of time on is, is policyholder complaints. And so um, related to claims. And so this is, you know, kind of the ultimate reason for buying insurance is that, that losses happen, claims uh, will be filed, and, and of course the vast majority of claims are, are paid uh, in a timely fashion. There's no problem, but, but um, certainly at times there can be a claim that may be denied that a, that a court or an arbitrator may, may view as, um, as inappropriately denied. And so insurance departments will also be involved in fielding and, and investigating any complaints that would come from constituents as well. Um, kind of in the worst case, an insurer um, could become bankrupt. And so the, the insurance word that we use for bankrupt is that that company would be insolvent. And all that means, of course, is that there just isn't enough money um, that the insurer has to pay all the claims. So as, as you'd think, this is a pretty rare occurrence. Um, about 1% of insurers might become uh, insolvent or bankrupt in any year. Um, and there's in the US, there's around 1,000 life and health insurers, um, over 1,000 property and casualty insurers in the US. And so if we just go with kind of 1,000, uh, 1%, that would, that would suggest that around 10 insurers might become insolvent in any, any one year. So it's, it's not a big number, but of course, if that's your insurer, um, it, it's a big deal. Um, a few other things that insurance departments often are involved in. Um, there might be an insurer that um, needs to stop being an insurer, and so the department might issue a cease and desist order, um, certainly auditing the books, making sure that the, the numbers are um, what the insurer is saying they are, um, evaluate the financial strength of the insurer. We'll come back to that. Um, market conduct exams. Um, are, are done maybe not every year, but certainly um, over time looking at different sales functions, marketing, claims processes, and so forth. And, and, then, and then some of what a, a department will do as well is publishing uh, different booklets and pamphlets and so-called buyer's guides to help consumers be more informed as they um, purchase insurance. So, so as you think about your own situation or your own family, you might spend anywhere from 3 to 5% of your annual income on insurance. And so as part of uh, consumer protection, you want people to kind of understand as, as much as possible what they're buying um, so that they can make good decisions. Okay, so within these departments of insurance, um, the head person, the, the leader, um, often it's called commissioner. So a few states listed there, just to kind of mention California, Kansas, North Dakota. Um, but in some other states, um, the head person might be referred to as the director. Um, and in still other states, maybe the superintendent. 
a different name but same function. So in, in charge of the of the department. And and interestingly, in some states, um, and actually the most common method um, of of getting this head person is is that they would be appointed by the governor. Um, but you can see in a handful of states, there are a couple of handfuls. Um, this commissioner, director, or superintendent is actually elected, and so um, various states are, are holding elections. Um, and, and right now, and in the near future, and and so um, the insurance commissioner might also be elected. So as you'd expect, the folks who run for these positions or who get appointed often have some experience or certain expertise in in the business of insurance. Um, okay, so that's some of the activities that insurance departments do. What about some of the programs that that um, departments get involved in? So, so state governments um, often provide or even operate some different insurance programs uh, to achieve some different public policy objectives. And some of the common state programs, um, you'll be familiar with some of these. So workers' compensation funds. So uh, you know, you might think, oh, you know, workers' comp, you buy that from a private insurer. And while that's often true, um, in some states, the state is actually involved in, in providing workers' comp insurance. Um, unemployment insurance, auto insurance plans, um, so-called fair plans, and then beachfront and windstorm pools. And so we'll come back and, and touch on each of those. So workers' comp, um, in some states, the, the, the state, the state uh, monopolistic fund, as the name would suggest, is, is the only source of coverage for workers' comp. And so companies have got to purchase this. Um, there's, there's one place to get it, and that's the state workers' comp fund. That, that's not the typical um, way that it's set up, but some states um, are set up that way. Much more common. Um, to have maybe a state fund, but also that fund would compete with private insurers. So it's not so much a monopoly, but it'd be a competitive state fund. And, and the main idea here is that there's some um, additional market, typically referred to as a residual market, for employers who aren't able to get workers' comp coverage in the private market. So if, so if there's a law that a uh, business has got to have workers' comp, but they can't find it in the private market, um, then that's where this residual market comes into play, um, where, where firms can purchase work comp, albeit at higher rates, but at least they can get the coverage. Unemployment insurance, this really, if you think about it, um, you can't just go out and buy this from a private company. Um, but it's, but it's a coverage um, for which there is insurance provided through different state programs. And, and as you'd expect, the benefit levels vary by state. Um, minimum federal standards apply, of course. And, and it's interesting what a lot of research has shown is that these unemployment insurance programs can actually be a fairly good smoothing mechanism for the economy as a whole. Similarly, Auto insurance plans are, are quite common. And so the same idea with work comp, if we, if we have to have and we're required by law um, to drive our car, if, if we have to have liability insurance but we can't get that from a private insurer, then that's where these um, different state auto insurance plans come into play. And the basic idea here is, is that um, it's an example of another residual market. It's the buyers who are kind of left over after private insurers have um, offered coverage to the risks that they that they want to, and that and that buyers um, find the prices acceptable. But it's everyone left over after the primary market, and um, certainly these um, policies provided by the auto insurance plans would have relatively higher prices than in the primary market, the voluntary market, as you'd expect. 
Um, but again, coverage is available to these what are typically the higher risk drivers, and and the cost, you know, the premiums and the losses are then spread and shared among the insurers throughout the state. Professor Carson, uh, Frank Tomasello at the Griffith Foundation wanted to jump in for two reasons. First off, uh, we wanted to take a moment to remind participants that uh, if they have questions, they may type them into the online interface that appears on their computer screen, and uh, we certainly will entertain and pose those uh, throughout the program. Uh, and uh, number two, we wanted to, uh, to do just that, to introduce a question. Um, we hear a lot about natural disasters, uh, floods, hurricanes, for example. Uh, and we wonder, Professor, could you discuss how some states are addressing some of those risks to homeowners, uh, you know, through the, the lens of insurance availability? Uh, uh, Frank, great, great question. I appreciate it. Um, and, and whoever asked that. Um, yeah, so, um, and I think I'll, this will show up in a, in, a, in a few slides, but I'll mention it here. So some of these fair plans, an example, um, would be, and some of you may be familiar with this down in Florida, um, they've got a, a state insurance company referred to as Citizens Property, and it really is set up to accommodate homes, uh, homeowners who are not able to find property insurance on their house from a private insurer. And so, um, you know, to buy that house, the bank is going to require insurance. Um, even, at, even if there is no mortgage, uh, most people are going to want insurance on the property. But if they can't find it in the private market, then that's where Citizens comes in and, and provides coverage. Um, if we think back to last year, um, kind of late August, early September, um, uh, you'll recall when Hurricane Irma came through and, and affected a few different states. Um, the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation um, reported that about one million property owners um, in Florida filed claims related to Hurricane Irma. Um, and then they estimated that damages um, from the claims that they saw at that point were, were total about $10 billion. And so, um, Citizens, which is this um, kind of fair plan insurer of last resort, they um, estimated that they would pay out a little over um, a little over one billion in losses for about seventy thousand policyholders that that were in this kind of state run fair plan for policyholders who who hadn't found or uh, weren't able to get coverage in the private market. Um, and then related to citizens, that state-run insurer of last resort, as an example of a, of a type of fair plan, um, Florida has something um, kind of interesting. They also have a separate, uh, what they call the Florida Hurricane Catastrophe Fund, and, and that's, that's really um, a, uh, what's called a reinsurer to citizens. And so... Um, reinsurance is something that we'll touch on a little bit later, but it's the idea that even an insurer who provides coverage, um, even that insurer might want to transfer some of their risk to another insurer, and so that's this reinsurance. And the CAT fund for Florida reported about uh, $2 billion in losses just from Irma. And so that, that CAT fund seems to be pretty well funded. Um, but it backs up the citizens, um, which is which is related to these fair plans um, that we were talking about. So um, the next slide, I think, even touches on yeah some of these beachfront and windstorm plans. So very similar to these fair access to insurance types of plans, um, but these, of course, would definitely be focused on the wind damage um, and the property damage caused by hurricanes, and so. Um, you know, any of the states that you can think of that, that might be affected by hurricanes, um, very related to the fair plans that we were just talking about. You might be thinking, um, well, what about flood? And certainly there can be some crossover between the hurricane and flood coverage, but if it's 
if it's solely flood, then that's um, we should we should certainly mention this National Flood Insurance Program, which is part of the um, FEMA. And so uh, we'll just mention that here as well. Um, we we mentioned the idea that an, an insurer, um, you know, about one percent a year fail, and so it does happen. It's not too common, but um, there certainly should be a system in place to handle um, the fallout from the claims that aren't paid by the insurers who aren't able to pay them. And so that's what this guarantee fund system is. And so every state will have a guarantee fund. And its function, and it's run, of course, by the departments of insurance in each state. And it, its purpose is literally to pay the claims of these insurers who aren't able to pay them. So the insurers that ran out of money, for whatever reason, um, either more claims than they expected, um, worse, you know, larger claims than they expected, um, or as it may happen, sometimes uh, the the investments that the insurer made um, ended up not performing as well as as had ho been hoped for. So, so these guarantee funds will pay these claims, um, and interestingly, it's it's the insurers that didn't fail who get to pay the claims of the insurers who failed. And so earlier when we were talking about insurance prices and regulating prices, certainly departments of insurers will want to look at, you know, is this price too high? But when you think about these guarantee funds, you can see why an insurer cares about the price that their competitors charge. Because if, if they've got competitors out there charging prices that are too low, and that and one of those competitors runs out of money, guess who gets to pay the bill? It's that insurer that lost the business to that low-priced insurer. So, um, and then one other thing you might find interesting is even some household name, large, well-known insurers are uh, susceptible to insolvency. And so if, if we think back to uh, Hurricane Andrew in the early 90s, 92, I think, um, uh, and this is all in the newspapers and everything, so public knowledge, but even a company like State Farm um, suffered tremendous losses after Hurricane Andrew, and, and there's a homeowners company of State Farm and there's an auto company and even a, even the homeowners company of State Farm uh, back in the 90s technically uh, ran out of money and so the the auto part of State Farm came in and, and literally bailed out the homeowners part so it, so it's not just these smaller you know lesser known insurers that can be susceptible to insolvency okay um, another big area that departments of insurers will, will care about and look at is uh, different market conduct issues, um, and I'll, I'll put it solvency regulation in here as well. But again, the big picture is consumer protection, um, and part of that is, is to make sure that the insurers are financially sound. But as part of that, states certainly regulate how insurers conduct their business, um, as well as monitor their financial strength. So market conduct, what do we mean? Uh, this can relate to different sales practices. So certainly we don't want uh, insurers and their agents and producers um, selling coverage in a deceptive way. And so uh, where that has happened in the past, departments of insurance have, have you know, certainly stepped in to try to prevent it on the front end, but if it's not prevented, to take action afterwards. From an underwriting perspective, um, an example of where uh, a Department of Insurance might be involved is in is in either kind of approving or disapproving certain factors that are used in the ratings process. And so, one one of these that you may have heard of is this idea of a credit score. And so, you hear all the 
you know, ads on the radio and TV about credit scores, and you want to have a good one. Um, interestingly, uh, many insurers have found that that a really good predictor of losses for some types of insurance is is credit score. And while that um, may seem advantageous in in some circumstances in, in insurance underwriting, some states have said uh, no. Uh, for various reasons, you know, we don't like insurers to use credit scores. And so um, some states have literally said, you know, you, you can't use credit score as an underwriting factor. So departments of insurance are involved in things like that. And then, as we mentioned, um, sometimes uh, in the claims process, there's, there's issues and problems that can come up. And um, departments of insurance will get involved often in those situations as well. To, to help the consumer and the insurer um, kind of come to terms and make sure that consumers are treated appropriately. Um, on the sales and underwriting side, so um, if there's, um, as we mentioned, some kind of issue in the sales uh, practice, uh, like a deceptive, um, deceptive sales, certainly that could result in the suspension or even revocation of a producer's license. Um, and if, if the insurer was found um, kind of you know, complicit and, and a part of what was going on, and that the insurer wasn't taking responsible, appropriate action, the, the insurer itself could lose their license. Um, on the claim side, Different, you know, examples of different ways that um, an insurer or a claim rep might be um, fined for, for example, offering an unfairly low settlement. So, so if, if a loss, you know, objectively is ten thousand, but the insurer offers far lower than that, um, that's not a good thing. Failing to explain why a claim was denied. Um, can also lead to a fine or some uh, course of action from the department. Uh, misrepresenting policy provisions, um, and then and then just kind of big picture, unreasonably denying or delaying um, resolution of a claim. So the kind of big catch-all term for this is uh, bad faith, and the departments of insurance want to make sure that the insurers are acting in good faith, and if they're not, then there's uh, steps in place that departments will put into action. Uh, solvency, we keep coming back to solvency. Again, just because uh, if the insurer is unable to pay the claims, then that contract for which a premium was paid for by consumers, um, you know, is in a sense all for nothing if, if there's no money to pay the claim. So solvency, again, this idea that the insurer is able to meet their financial obligations as they as they occur, and and it's um, interesting, you know, some of these claims, uh, a car running into a, a wall or another car, um, but the auto damage itself, you you can see that you can get a pretty good estimate of the damage right away, and the insurer can pay that claim, you know, relatively quickly. For other types of claims, the the loss itself. And especially the amount of the loss might take much longer um, to, to be realized. And so these types of claims are often referred to as, quote, long tail claims. So you can imagine um, uh, an oil tank or a gas tank underground that is leaking, and we might not even know about that damage for years and years and decades and decades. Um, similarly, uh, claims related to as asbestos and the um, health issues that, that um, sometimes came out of that, that, that we just didn't know about them right away, and then it took a while for those claims to develop. Okay. Professor, to Carson, sure, uh, uh, Professor Carson, Frank Tomasello here. I thought we'd uh, jump in with a quick question uh, on the solvency side. Um, can you speak very briefly to what role uh, blockchain does or might eventually play in the process of verifying solvency? Um, and specifically, uh, can or might it provide regulators with uh, direct access to insurer financials? 
Yeah, uh, another great question. So, so um, I think you know, uh, blockchain. We've been reading about this for for a year, a couple years, um, and more. And and it seems to be an issue, a, a, a method, a technology a, um, that is being implemented um, in a lot of different industries. Um, you know, it gets the it gets the press in some of the underlying technology for currencies, um, but in in things like real estate, um, in industries like insurance, and when you think about solvency for an insurer, um, the the big area that blockchain seems to be making an impact. You you can think about it in claims, of course, um, but when but when you think about it in terms of solvency. Um, and the assets that insurers hold and the different transactions that lead to those assets. Um, I think much like many other areas, that blockchain is and will continue to have a, a very important impact in, in insurers' ability to um, not only monitor their own solvency but for regulators to um, keep better tabs on that as well. Thank you. Um, and that kind of ties into to what we're talking about on on this slide, in the sense that regulators are really trying to verify um, the financial position of of insurers, and so and so in doing that, we'll have to set some bars. So, what are the financial requirements? Um, we'll conduct some field exams, literally, you know, going to the insurer, meeting the management, talking with the management reviewing the various financial statements. Um, some, some different methods and approaches that, that are out there that people will hear about is this so-called IRIS, so Insurance Regulatory Information System. That's been around for quite a while, um, but, it, but it tends to provide some good information. It's, it's essentially a set of ratios that um, insurers should kind of stay within certain boundaries. So for example, uh, how much premiums, um, what's the total premium volume that an insurer is, is writing relative to that insurer's surplus? And so you can, you can kind of think of this as um, a debt to equity ratio. And the idea is that you don't want to um, take on too much debt by, by selling too much insurance relative to the, to the company's equity. So in, in insurance, um, we call equity surplus, and we don't want too much debt relative to surplus. Um, okay, I'll just briefly touch on some of the different um, solvency uh, financial requirements. So different states will set different minimums in terms of a uh, minimum amount of capital um, that an insurer needs to have to, to not only start the company but then to maintain solvency. And then, and then that standard will apply to all the licensed insurers um, in that state that are in the same lines of business. But then, um, not surprisingly, different states will choose different levels of um, capital requirements, uh, different levels of, of um, riskiness when it comes to different assets and so forth. So there's a lot of similarity, but it's not necessarily completely uniform across the states. Field exams, we mentioned these. Probably not every year we'll you know, talk with management, but certainly every three to five years. Um, but we'll certainly focus on the financial statements, um, not only every year, but, but probably even more often than that. Where do we get this financial information? It's, it's really from the um, annual financial statements. So annual statements, what we're talking about here are the balance sheets, the income statements, all the um, individual assets and liabilities of the insurer. And so companies will submit these to uh, state insurance departments. There's a particular format um, that has to be followed. And so it's not necessarily, in fact, it's not uh, so-called gap um, statements, but it's but it's literally state accounting uh, procedures. And so we'll follow that format. And it's really got uh, virtually everything. So from the premiums that were uh, collected 
the expenses that were incurred, the, the particular investments that were made, um, amounts that were paid in losses, and then these, um, what is the most important uh, entry on the liability side is the reserves, the insurer's reserves. And that's really, you know, we've sold the policies, we've paid the agents, um, paid all our other bills, but we need to make an estimate of what do we think the losses are going to be over time. And so reserves, it kind of sounds like an asset, but reserves are really technically a, a liability. And it's our estimate of what we think losses and claims are going to be over time. And so the reserve is a liability against which we need to have assets to cover those reserves. And so um, looking down there, um, uh, we get, what would be some examples of assets? So the biggest category of asset that most insurers have would be uh, bonds. So maybe some corporate bonds, but, but largely government bonds. Uh, maybe some stocks, uh, some cash, maybe some real estate, um, and, and so on. But those are the big categories. The liabilities, the big one is, is are these reserves. So how much are claims going to be? And then, like any any solid company, um, when we look at our assets minus liabilities, uh, we want to have something left over. And instead of calling that owner's equity or equity, um, in insurance we call that surplus. And so we want to have a lot of surplus, and that's really our, um, you can think of it as our cushion in case our estimates are too low, then we've got a little bit left over. Um, in addition, we really can't write any new business, any new insurance, if we don't have any surplus. And so surplus is, is really, um, really important for insurers. Uh, we mentioned this uh, IRIS system. It's a, it's a system to try to identify as early as possible if an insurer is moving toward a financially unstable, unsound position. And so it's a system of ratios. Um, you kind of track these ratios over time. You can look at them as a snapshot as well. And, and you want to kind of get a feel for, um, you know, are they taking on too much leverage? Um, have things changed too much? Are they growing too fast? Um, are they shrinking? And it really is a system to kind of help departments of insurers identify companies that have potential um, problems in the, in the future. And so you, you, um, you want to, of course, identify these as early as possible. Um, the NAIC um, was instrumental in kind of coming up with this and designing it, um, but regulators um, have the role of administering it. Um, along with some other tools as well. So in addition to IRIS, there's another system um, called FAST. And, and there's other systems out there that weren't necessarily developed um, by regulators or the NAIC, but that are out there that, that can be used as well. Um, if, an, if an insurer does go bankrupt, um, and the way that usually happens is the Department of Insurance will declare it, declare it as so. And so um, it, it could happen before the department declares it, but usually um, it happens because the department has said, um, you know, we deem you insolvent and, and we're taking steps to deal with the situation. So what can be done? Um, that, that insurer might be placed um, in receivership. Um, to try to be rehabilitated. Um, it, the insurer could be either partially or, or completely taken over. Um, and, and then also it, it uh, may be dissolved and the contracts, the insurance policies could be assigned to another insurer. So a few different ways that uh, regulators will deal with a company that's um, struggling financially. So remember, uh, we mentioned these guarantee funds earlier, and so <clears throat> a person who has a, a policy from an insurer that can't pay the claim, um, that person um, 
likely, almost certainly will, have coverage through the guarantee fund. The issue to mention, though, <coughs> excuse me, is that there are maximum limits on that claim. So, so for example, if if um, if we've got a, a very nice Ferrari um, insured. And, and our insurer happened to go bankrupt and can't pay the claim. Um, you know, if it's a, a collectible Ferrari worth a million dollars, that that claim probably is, is almost certainly not going to be fully paid by the guarantee fund. So there may be a $200,000 limit, $300,000 limit um, that, again, varies by state. Um, something that's uh, very interesting and, and that's developed over time over the last um, 10 or 12 years or so um, with a lot of work done is this interstate insurance compact. And, and it's really um, a, an initiative to kind of um, improve and modernize the system of insurance regulation. And one of the big ideas um, and facets of this is that um, many insurers operate, as you'd expect, across multiple states. And so the so-called multi-state insurers, um, as, as it traditionally has been, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you've got literally 50 different sets of laws and rules. And as you can imagine, that, that adds significant cost to the distribution side of, of insurance um, and, and which as with any business, then has to be passed on to consumers. So it's not only costly for, for insurers, but ultimately costly for consumers. And so um, the idea is that you know, if there's some way that we can streamline and improve the efficiency um, of how insurance products are filed with regulators, reviewed by regulators, and ultimately approved, then that should um, help improve uh, uniformity, on how quickly policies can get to the market. And that really has, has come a long way in the last 10 or 12 years. And so this idea of an interstate insurance compact, um, a lot of work done by a lot of um, different parties um, that, that has, has borne a lot of, a lot of um, fruit. Professor Carson, uh, it's Frank Tomasello. wanted to jump in here with a, uh, a question for your uh, reaction to. Uh, with the passage of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act uh, back in 2010 came establishment of the Federal Insurance Office, referred to by many as uh, FIO. Could you speak to the role uh, that FIO plays, uh, and does FIO displace in any way uh, the long-established state-based system of insurance regulation? Oh, perfect. Um, so, yeah, uh, I love the kind of current issue, um, um, insurance regulation focus. So, so the FIO is, is really housed within the Department of Treasury. Um, it's got a director who, who's appointed by the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, and what the Federal Insurance Office is, is really doing, they're, they're, they've got a very important role in the sense of providing a lot of expertise and advice regarding insurance matters um, to the Treasury as well as other federal agencies. But um, I would say it's really important to emphasize it's, uh, while it does a lot, it's not a regulatory agency uh, per se, and it's, it's the authority that the FIO has um, really doesn't um, kind of displace any state insurance regulatory system. Um, and in fact, the NAIC coordinates very closely with uh, the Federal Insurance Office. Um, uh, and, and this serves as a, I guess, an information resource for the federal government and, um, and as well to engage it in, in some very important international discussions, especially in recent years in conjunction with some of these U.S. Um, insurance regulators. So, um, and then I guess also I'd mention the FIO, um, its authority extends um, to, a, to a lot of different lines of insurance, 
but it doesn't extend to something like uh, health insurance, long-term care, um, and, and even crop insurance, which of course is, is covered by the Federal Crop Insurance Act. So it, um, the FIO, uh, you know, kind of very important, relatively newer uh, insurance body, but it, but it does not have supervisory or regulatory authority over the broad business of insurance. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, okay, so let's see, rate, rate and form regulation, I think we've touched on a little bit. Um, the, the departments will look at the prices charged and the forms that um, insurers can use. The main goals that we're looking for, um, again, is that prices should be at least high enough to provide funds to pay claims but at the same time not too high, nor do we want the um, prices and the rates to unfairly discriminate against anybody. Um, the types of rate regulation that a state may use um, varies, and it might be some combination of these, but some, some different concepts would be that um, some rates have to be approved, and if they do, they either have to be approved prior to being used by an insurer, or um, some states will say, no, you can just file your, your rates, file your rates and start using them, and, and hopefully, ultimately, we'll approve those and there's no problem. If there is a problem, then, then of course, you'd have to kind of go back and change things. Um, other states will say, um, go ahead and use uh, your rates and then file them later. Um, another way to do it is to have a flex rating, kind of a, a band of rates within which prices are acceptable. And then other states for certain lines of insurance will just say, you know what, uh, charge whatever you want and, and go compete. Um, at least on the, on the price side, um, that exists as well. Uh, forms, you know, we want consumers, again, to be able to understand these so they can make good decisions. So departments will review the forms. Uh, within those, that would include the content as well, of course, and the specific provisions, how easy um, and readable are the contracts. Um, the main, <coughs> excuse me, markets that we think about, you know, kind of auto, home, and so forth, um, are covered by the standard market, but, but some coverages and some risks don't really uh, fall into the standard market. And so, so there are some exemptions for these either hard to place risks or different kinds of coverages that just don't fall into the standard market. And so often these are referred to as surplus lines and the insurers that sell coverage there are referred to as surplus lines insurers. And so these kind of hard to place risks or coverages that just don't fall into the standard market. Um, Mr. Carson, uh, uh, apologies, but if, if we may jump in with a, uh, a quick question, and I know that time is uh, at a premium here, uh, our hour is, is quickly evaporating, but uh, in May, the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act was signed into law by the President. Uh, and our question for you is, if you could, uh, very briefly, could you speak to the, uh, the impact uh, that law will have on insurance regulation? Yeah, great. Um, and it kind of ties into what we were talking about a few minutes ago um, when we mentioned these international um, discussions and negotiations. But essentially, um, one of the most important aspects of this act, the Economic Growth Act, um, is that federal, federal officials should uh, really aim to achieve consensus positions with different state regulators. Um, when it comes to negotiating uh, these any international agreements related to insurance. And so certainly, you know, we could get into a lot of detail there, but I, I'd say that's the big picture. And so great question. Thank you. And and I know, I know we wanted to make sure and have, you know, enough slides to fill the hour. Um, 
and and I can either keep going or or do we want to uh, call it a day here? Well, we are up against our hour uh, timeline. If possible, perhaps we could sneak in a uh, uh, a question that was submitted that I think uh, it's important that we pose. Uh, sure. And uh, we can let folks know that uh, uh, certainly we're able to make uh, uh, additional materials in print format available, that is, the slide deck, et cetera, post-program. Um, we did receive a, uh, a question from one of our participants that goes to uh, risk assessment and Internet security breaches, this notion of cyber breaches uh, and uh, what impact uh, cyber breaches may have uh, on the insurance industry and then by extension the relationship perhaps uh, of the industry uh, to those companies it's insuring. Um, interested in your thoughts on, uh, on, on that topic. Yeah, great, great question and, and certainly one that um, you know, 40, 50 years ago, even 30, uh, we wouldn't have needed to worry about as much, but I think there's probably no issue you know, I guess you can think about nuclear, chemical, biological as well. But certainly cyber um, on a day-to-day -day basis is, is, is up there. Um, I think, to, um, and I've listened to a lot of experts on this and, and insurers. So, so one thing, insurers are certainly writing and selling cyber coverage. Um, often just to kind of get, get their foot in the door, um, be part of a developing market, try to get some uh, data, data points, experience with how best to write coverage, do just, uh, judicial um, interpretation of, of the contracts that they've written, the insurance policies, and to, to start to understand the claims that come in on that. But when it comes to pricing of the policies. Um, most of, of what I'm hearing is that it's uh, very difficult, to say the least, to know if, if the prices that are being charged are proper prices. Um, of course, if anything, they're probably too low, uh, but we'll see. Um, and and that, um, that certainly uh, cyber is, is the the losses that come from cyber, cyber um, kind of like earthquakes and hurricanes, they're, they may be few and far between, but, but when, they, when they do happen, um, they can happen on a very large scale. And that at this point, it's, it's still such a, a new developing area that um, the insurers that are participating in the, in the marketing and sales of the coverage. Um, on the one hand, it, it's great uh, because companies want that coverage. In fact, cyber is often mentioned in almost every survey as the number one concern of risk managers. So it's high on the list for insurers and it's high on the list for companies buying the coverage. Um, I think the jury is still out as to whether the prices being charged for the policies are going to be ad adequate. Uh, at the same time, though, even if the prices being charged prove to be inadequate, um, the financial strength of the insurers selling that coverage, um, I think it, it makes it paramount for buyers of the coverage to buy from very financially strong insurers so that uh, the, the surplus and the, the resources to pay claims uh, that may be much higher than the prices were charged related to those contracts themselves. Professor, thank you. Uh, appreciate the response to the question, uh, and we appreciate your sharing your expertise with us for this hour uh, this afternoon. It has been informative. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for today. We want to thank all, all of the folks for joining us uh, via webinar and, and for their questions and participation. Uh, thanks also to Ethan Wilson and his team at NCSL uh, and to members of the NCSL Task Force uh, for their encouragement. 
uh, in uh, producing this and other programs in collaboration with NCSL. Uh, but uh, most important, we, we thank all of the folks for participating and joining us today. Uh, importantly, this webinar has been recorded. It will be available on the NCSL website. So if you've missed any part of the program or you'd like to recommend it to a colleague, uh, know that it will soon be available. Um, finally, be sure to check the NCSL website for information about future NCSL Griffith Foundation collaborative programming. Uh, we have plans to deliver some additional programs uh, throughout the course of the year. Uh, with that, uh, this is Frank Tomasello with the Institute's Griffith Foundation. We thank you for joining us, and we bid you a pleasant good afternoon.